everyone and thank you all for joining us for our webinar today. My name is Stephanie Baskerville. I am the content writer here at ProServe IT and I'm going to be your webinar co-host today. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar entitled Remote Working 103, Windows Virtual Desktop Makes Remote Working Easier. Um, we've got a lot of great content for you today and it is my privilege to uh, introduce the person that's going to take us through it all. Um, Bill Kastner is one of ProServe IT's amazing solutions architects specializing in Microsoft Azure. As Bill explains, Azure is like the Swiss army knife of tool sets and products and Bill enjoys the opportunity to provide customer education on the versatility and diversity of this um, wonderful tool. So welcome, Bill, and it's a, a pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks, Stephanie. Great to be here. <laughs> Yeah, you're welcome, of course. Before we get started, folks, um, I'd just like to point out to you that if you have a question or two uh, throughout this webinar, you can feel free to use that questions tab on the GoToWebinar platform. Um, I'm going to be monitoring that window kind of throughout Bill's presentation and, um, you know, more than happy to read those questions as they come in and get those questions answered for you. So please don't be shy. Feel free to use that uh, that tab anytime you'd like and, and ask as many questions as you, as you need to. Um, so, you know, in terms of, of remote working, you know, we understand that the global workforce landscape is, is changing quite a bit, uh, almost hourly, it seems. And it, many organizations are making that decision or being told to make the decision um, to move to remote working for the foreseeable future. So in today's webinar, um, we want to introduce a potential way for you to get your organization switched over to remote working without sacrificing that productivity, connectivity, or collaboration um, among those team members who are suddenly finding themselves working from home. And, you know, therefore, we're, we're kind of going to talk a lot about um, Windows Virtual Desktop in greater detail, including sort of benefits and use cases as it pertains to helping your employees get up and running remotely during this sort of unprecedented time. Um, so for this, I mean, you know, I'm clearly not the expert in this at all. So I'm going to pass things over to Bill and uh, let him guide us through sort of an introduction to Windows Virtual Desktop. And I think, Bill, you've probably got um, the agenda on the next slide there as well. So maybe you can uh, introduce our topic and introduce yourself and uh, take it away. You bet. Thanks, Stephanie. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today, as Stephanie mentioned, we're going to talk about Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, we've gone through a little bit of an introduction. Uh, already, we're going to talk about what Windows Virtual Desktop is, uh, talk to the benefits of Windows Virtual Desktop, and then follow that with next steps and then some Q&A. So when we talk about desktop virtualization, um, historically, it's really been there to address a number of specific business needs. Um, so for those uh, business organizations who either face you know, regulatory requirements or have strong security uh, requirements necessary due to the nature of their business, uh, VDI has always been a, a great uh, opportunity there as it provides a consistent end user experience um, and is typically an easier solution to maintain across you know, a disparate uh, user population. Similarly, for those who have an elastic workforce um, who might, you know, maybe your, your business ebbs and flows um, and it's, it can be a challenge to maintain the number of desktops required for, for any given staff, especially if there's large fluctuations due to seasonality or just sort of the nature of the business. Uh, for those who have highly mobile users, but you know, IT still wants to be able to provide a consistent desktop experience, uh, regardless of where that user is or what device that user might be working from, uh, VDI is a great example there. And then also we have specialized workloads. Um, so for those who have you know specific use cases, uh, user types who require specific applications or specific configurations of applications. Uh, VDI can often be a good example or a good uh, solution to address some of those challenges. Um, and I will apologize, so I'm already using acronyms. So VDI is Virtual Desktop Infrastructure. Um, virtual Desktop Infrastructure or VDI and Desktop, virtual, desktop Virtualization are usually interchangeable. Um, I may commonly use VDI versus the others, but I just want to make sure everybody's sort of clear on what we're talking about here. <laughs> so. In the past, when we've talked about uh, VDI or, or virtual desktops, there's really been two solution, solutions available to us, both with pros and cons. Uh, the first would be our Windows Server desktop experience. And this is probably what's, what most people have, have commonly seen in the past. This would be remote uh, desktop services or terminal services from, from Microsoft. Um, the benefit of, of this server desktop experience is it does allow for um, scalability and, and multi-session scenarios. So, you know, you have the ability to stand up a single, you know, 
remote desktop server or RDS server. You can load up multiple users depending on what workloads they require. Um, it provides an easy way to provide uh, remote desktop services to a broad number of users, but there are some limitations. First and foremost being that it is still a server-based operating system, not your traditional client-based operating system. And while there's a lot of commonality between look and feel, uh, you don't have all the same functionality on the server side you would on the desktop. So users, when they log into a remote desktop session, while well, it's a familiar experience and they have all the same applications, they don't necessarily have all that same functionality that they would. Um, it does support, as I mentioned, multi-session. It supports 32-bit applications. Um, typically, you're, when you're loading Office onto an RDS server, or remote desktop server, uh, you're leveraging the, the perpetual licensing. And server sit, typically sits in a long-term servicing channel. If we flip over to, to uh, the, the client side, so this would be a solution similar to Zen Desktop or um, VMware Horizon, um, but this is providing a single uh, client desktop experience on a per user basis. So often this gets configured in a one-to-one -one scenario. Um, you don't have the ability to load multiple users on a given workstation. Each Windows 10 workstation you bring up is going to service a single user. And this can often require you to build out a much larger um, desktop pool than might be easily supported on, on you know, traditional hardware, depending on the size of the organization and the challenges. But by running that desktop operating system, we do have some benefits, uh, specifically being not only do we support Win32 apps, but we also su uh, support uh, UWP. We are able to leverage Office 365 Pro Plus and, and all the associated benefits with that. And again, being a, a Windows client-based OS versus server, historically it's sort of been a, a more frequent update um, channel as well. So one of the things that Windows uh, Virtual Desktop or WVD has introduced is sort of the, a hybrid or best of both worlds. And that's Windows 10 Enterprise multi-session uh, scenarios. So basically you have the same scalability that you would have with remote desktop services with that server-based OS but you're adding all of the benefit of the client uh, elements of, of the Windows 10 experience as well. So we're able to provide everybody with a full-blown Windows 10 desktop, uh, which gives them the, that modern uh, Windows user experience. We're able to support multiple Windows 10 sessions on a given Windows 10 VM. Uh, we are able to take advantage of both Win32 and UWP-based apps. We're able to take advantage of Office Pro Plus, um, and again, that accelerated um, semi-annual ch annual channel as well. Um, also because it's a client operating system, we're able to take advantage of all the Windows 10 enterprise security features, which is a huge benefit as well. So when we talk about Windows uh, Virtual Desktop or uh, WVD benefits, um, like I said, there's a couple of key ones to, to point out. So one, as mentioned, with WVD, we do have the ability to support either single or multi-session Windows 10 experiences. Uh, optimized for Office 365 Pro Plus. We actually have images that have the, the Pro Plus uh, elements baked in. We do still support Windows Server uh, 2012 R2 or newer. So as I mentioned, you know we have the added benefits of Windows 10 multi-session, but we still have the ability to run legacy environments like remote desktop services or those Windows 10 uh, single instance sessions as well. So we can support all three of those scenarios in Windows Virtual Desktop. This solution provides a ton of flexibility um, as it does allow you to virtualize both desktops and apps. Um, so depending on what that use case is, whether you're working from a traditional PC, whether you're working from you know, iPad or an Android phone, you know, depending on, on the uh, resolution you're working with and, and the applications you require access to, it's great to have that flexibility of either doing desktops or apps on a per user basis. And then we also have the ability to integrate with the security management of Microsoft 365. Um, so again, because we're in a Windows 10 enterprise platform, we can take advantage of all those benefits as well as all the ones that are inherently native to Microsoft 365. When we talk about optimizations for Office Pro Plus, uh, a couple key things to, to point out. One being that Office 365 Pro Plus, which for those who might not be familiar, is the client software of Office 365. So basically Pro Plus is your same Outlook, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Teams, all those different products, uh, but it's basically being purchased through the Office 365 subscription. But it has been designed um, to work in this multi-user scenario. Um, so some of the challenges we've seen in the past is loading up multiple instances of Office on a given, you know, like an RDS server, a remote desktop server, um, you start to face some, some performance challenges as you load up additional users. 
ProPlus has been designed with this Windows 10 multi-session methodology in mind, and has been designed to ensure that each of the users that are stationed on a, a given workstation um, have a, a, a positive end user experience and, and a good performance from the client, such as Outlook and OneDrive for Business. We also have the ability to leverage profile containers, uh, which will enable faster uh, and, and better performing experiences for non-persistent environments. And we're gonna dig into that a little bit deeper because this is one of the key differentiators, I think, that Windows uh, Virtual Desktops provides over some of our traditional VDI solutions that we've seen in the past. Um, as mentioned, so RDS is a supported component of Windows Virtual Desktop. So should you happen to be running um, you know, RDS today, uh, based off of server 2012 or, or newer, there is a migration plan to actually take those services and migrate that to uh, to Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, so you can still con con continue to support the same services that you have today. The benefit of hosting on an Azure obviously being much more scalability, um, you know, potentially better connectivity, um, and it just gives you a little more flexibility in how you manage that. Um, for some organizations, this will be sort of an interim or, or, or intermediary step for those organizations that want to transition to the full-blown Windows 10 multi-session experience. But if you've already made investments in, in remote desktop services and want to just start to, to at least get into the Windows uh, virtual desktop space, there is that migration path available to you. And from an app comp compatibility perspective, we do support uh, existing Windows Server images that have been used on-prem. So again, this allows you to get up and running in a, a much faster process by just sort of lifting and shifting the infrastructure you have on-prem and transitioning that to the cloud. Because this is Azure based, um, we have the ability to deploy and scale very quickly. Um, so Azure, as, as many of you are likely aware, um, is offered across 140 countries and 54 regions. Um, so you're able to provide local services should you have uh, staff who work in remote locations or other countries. Um, because Windows Virtual Desktop is built on top of Azure, you're able to leverage the Azure management portal to support this. So again, one of the nice things from an Azure perspective is you know, any of the services or, or new technologies get introduced into Azure, they're just added as additional blades inside the Azure management portal, which provides that unified uh, management structure, which helps again ease adoption. We also have built-in security and compliance, both from the Windows um, desktop perspective and all the benefit, associated benefits around Azure as well. So one of the key differentiators, I think, from, from leveraging WVD over some of the other solutions is the fact that it is uh, embedded in Azure, powered by Azure. Um, Azure obviously has a number of associated benefits with it. Uh, first being that, you know, from a productivity standpoint, you know, Azure, one of the great things that Azure brings to the table is the fact that, you know, with Microsoft managing all that core underlying infrastructure, you're typically only managing things at the, the user level or the data level itself. All those underlying components are, are typically managed by Microsoft, which makes it real easy to, to spin up new infrastructure, to introduce new, uh, new solutions into your existing environment in a quick and easy fashion uh, with reduced administration. Um, so you're able to get productive far faster in an Azure scenario than you would necessarily on-prem, where you need to build net new servers from the ground up, you know, either hardware or virtual, and, and manage all the, the components to get to it and then solution versus Azure. A lot of that work has been done for you. It's a matter of pointing and clicking and adding that new service to your Azure tenant. Um, and then you can quickly adopt that new technology. From a hybrid perspective, so Azure does support uh, hybrid scenarios. So you're able to extend your on-prem data center to the cloud. Um, so there's no requirement to shift your entire infrastructure to Azure to take advantage of a lot of these benefits, including Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, you can continue to run you know, the bulk of your legacy infrastructure on-prem and just leverage Azure where it makes sense in that hybrid scenario. Uh, there's a ton of intelligence behind uh, Azure and Microsoft has done a really good job of providing guidance and, and tips and recommendations um, on, on how to improve your overall Azure experience and help key costs and control as well. Um, so there's a, a number of, of key elements inside of Azure where you know, through advisors and, and recommendations and such, you know, they can really help streamline a lot of the deployment opportunities that you may see and help uh, facilitate a lot of the, the challenges that customers typically face when trying to deploy new technologies. Lastly, Azure is a trusted platform. Um, so Microsoft you know, invests you know, billions of dollars in, in security 
they have a, a large workforce that's dedicated to, to security. Microsoft being such a public company, um, they are one of the most uh, attacked organizations across the planet. They're able to derive a ton of insights as to the methods in which organizations get attacked or, or probed and such. They obviously leverage that to support their, their wide range of internal platforms, but they also take those learnings and distill them down to customers as well. And those who rely on Microsoft Cloud technology like Azure and Office 365 and, and EMS and such are able to take advantage of all these uh, security benefits that, that Microsoft has learned uh, through their own experience and are able to share with the, the user community. This can really help ensure that customer environments can be often far more secure in Azure than they are on-prem because you're able to take advantage of all of the learnings and all of the technologies uh, that Microsoft makes available to help ensure that it's a trusted and secure platform. Uh, from a high level architecture perspective, so as mentioned, because this is built on, on Azure, um, there's a couple of key benefits associated with that. Uh, first and foremost is this is going to leverage your Azure Active Directory identity management services. So for customers who are already using Office 365 today or any other cloud solution from Microsoft that's required you to deploy Azure AD Connect, so you're syncing your on-prem Active Directory users' uh, accounts into, into the cloud, those identities that have been uh, migrated or, or synchronized rather are what are actually used to, have, to leverage Windows Virtual Desktop. So many customers are already having leveraged Office 365 from an end user identity perspective, all those accounts already exist and are immediately available to be used through Windows Virtual Desktop. Microsoft, Azure also provides a virtualization infrastructure as a managed services. So by this, we mean, if you look sort of on the right-hand side of the page there, you can see, you know, from a managed by Microsoft perspective, um, you know, things like gateways and brokers, load balancing, uh, management, web access consoles, all those pieces that you would typically need to consider as part of a deployment for a remote desktop solution or, or VDI style solution, all of that gets managed by Microsoft, which cuts down on the amount of effort to either stand up net new infrastructure or to continue to manage on an ongoing basis. Similarly, if you look at the bottom of the screen on the right, you'll see compute storage and networking. Again, because this is an Azure-based solution, Microsoft is managing all those underlying uh, elements for you as well. And really all you're responsible for managing then is the actual virtual desktop elements itself. So what, be it Windows 7, Windows 10, a remote app or other server-based operating system, the applications and the users. Um, so the managed service element, again, takes out all of the underlying pieces that are, are sort of foundational to the environment, but not overly unique or interesting, but do re typically require IT cycles to, to support and to manage on an ongoing basis. And all that gets offloaded to Microsoft in this scenario. And it just allows IT to manage the core elements that are really important to the business, like the actual desktop experience and the user experience. Um, as mentioned, so because this is Azure based, as you deploy and manage VMs, it will sit within your, your traditional Azure subscription. Um, you do have the ability to leverage existing tool sets like System Center Configuration Manager and Intune. So if you do customizations or tailoring that's required, uh, whether you're using you know, DCM, like Desired Configuration Manager, or some of the other elements of, of Config Manager, all of those are still available to you as you, you know, deploy uh, VDI through Windows Virtual Desktop. And then lastly, you have the ability to connect to on-prem resources. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, you know, there's no requirement to move your server infrastructure to Azure to be able to leverage or take advantage of Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, you can, you know, in that hybrid scenario where you have site-to-site -site connectivity between Azure and on-prem, you do have the ability to deploy Windows Virtual Desktop in the cloud and then point back to on-prem resources. Naturally, there are some, some caveats or con considerations in that scenario. Um, depending on the application, you may not have that same level of performance you're looking for. You know, for organizations that maybe are running a client server-based application, you typically want that client and server to be fairly close to each other. So in that scenario, if you were to deploy Windows Virtual Desktop in Azure, load the client software for that, that client server app and tie back to an on-prem server application, depending on the nature of the application, it may or may not work um, you know, as expected or provide that, the level of performance that are required. So there absolutely are some scenarios where those application servers were going to want to uh, lift and shift or migrate into Azure just to provide that, that positive end user experience. But a number of other applications, you know, we can continue to run on-prem and run in this hybrid scenario. The benefit being we can deploy Windows Virtual Desktop in a fairly quick fashion, tie back to all of your on-prem existing infrastructure, 
provide your your remote users uh, easy access to that infrastructure uh, with you know relatively few moving parts that need to be adjusted in order to make the solution work. Microsoft has made an investment in an organization called FS Logics, um, which some of you, if any of you have dealt with VDI in the past, may be familiar with um, as they've been around for a number of years. Uh, but FS Logics and that acquisition really provides a number of key benefits to Windows Virtual Desktop um, and really, I think, allow, to, or allow WVD to stand out from some of the other competition in this space. The, the specific one that, that comes to mind a lot is, is around profile container. So one of the challenges that we see with VDI in the past is end user experience, um, specifically around things like office applications have often been a challenge. Um, so traditional VDI, um, you know, we've got two different types of desktops that we can present, persistent or non-persistent desktops. Persistent are basically uh, dedicated virtual machines to a given user. So when a user logs into their VDI session, each and every time they log into the same persistent desktop that's essentially reserved for them which means that all of their user data is immediately accessible. Um, you know, Outlook is running in cache mode and their OST file or, or cache data is immediately accessible to them. Uh, but running persistent desktops can often be an expensive proposition. It really, it often doesn't make sense to deploy individual desktops to, to users because you wanna take advantage of, um, you know, not every user is going to be logged in at all times every day. So it typically makes more sense to have a pool of desktops and people can just sort of log into various desktops as they need without having them dedicated to one particular user. And that's called non-persistent. The challenge we face with non-persistent desktops in the past is, as I mentioned, Outlook, um, you know, in a perfect scenario, we typically want Outlook to be cached. Um, so for those of you who are in Office 365, you're probably already aware of this. Uh, for those who might still be running an on-prem exchange environment, um, sort of walk through this very quickly. So when your Exchange server is side by side with your Outlook client, doing a non-cached scenario with Outlook often works incredibly well. Uh, so basically in a non-cached scenario, every time you move from message to message and folder to folder, your Outlook client needs to go and talk to the Exchange server and grab the next piece of information. So as you click down to the next message, Outlook will reach out to the Exchange server, grab the next message contents and display it to you. When working on your local area network, that works very well um, and, and usually doesn't pose any challenges. For customers who move their organization or their email platform out to Office 365, having to go out to the internet every time you click message to message and folder to folder can often introduce delays. And sometimes this might only be a couple of seconds of time, uh, but if a user is trying to quickly move through their mailbox and click message to message to message, that you know two, three, four second delay each time can definitely impact productivity and cause some end user frustration. And so typically in an Office 365 scenario, we recommend that Outlook run in cached mode, which basically creates a local OST file that is a cache of your mailbox. And that allows users to work very quickly, uh, regardless of where they are in relation to their to Office 365. Because they're always working at that local cache, they get a very quick response time as they move message to message and folder to folder. With non-persistent desktops and VDI, that has often been a challenge to, to achieve. Uh, there have been some scenarios in the past where that's been viable, uh, but often what we find is a lot of customers tend to run non-persistent desktops, which means every time a user logs in, either that Outlook OST file or cache needs to be created on the fly, or they're running in a non-cache uh, non mode and re reaching out to, to the Office 365 server each and every time they click on a message. With FS Logix and their profile container uh, option, what ends up happening in a VDI scenario is the user's profile is actually maintained on a separate VHD file. Uh, so separate from the operating system. And as a user logs in, that profile uh, VHD gets attached to the VM. So you are able to take advantage of non-persistent desktops as a user can log into a different workstation every day or a different virtual, virtual workstation every day. But because all of their cached local data is on that external VHD drive, that gets attached every time they log in. So they get the benefit of having their, their cache data for Outlook, their cache data for OneDrive, Skype for Business and Teams DAO, Windows Search Database, all that sort of stuff can be maintained on that user profile VHD file. And as a user logs in each day, that just gets attached and provides some instant access to all of that data. And that's a huge differentiator from, from many of the other solutions that we've seen in the past. A couple other things that FS Logics allows us to do is app masking and Java redirection. So app masking allows us to uh, in, build virtual machines, install you know a number of different software products, 
and then use app masking to basically hide the applications that aren't relevant to a given user. I will say in the Windows Virtual Desktop in, uh, world, this is not our preferred mechanism for applications. We actually can do app attach where we have external applications, we just plug into the VM that are necessary. But for those organizations who either want to take a legacy gold image that might have applications for five different departments installed on it, or maybe they have applications that for whatever reason just can't be leveraged through app attach, app masking allows you to minimize the number of gold images that you have loaded up with the applications that are required, and then just leverage app masking to hide the applications that aren't relevant to a given user in their, their associated department. So it does make things a whole lot cleaner to, to manage uh, versus things like sequencing and, and things like that that you often have to do in other scenarios. Uh, the last item is Java redirection. So as many of you are likely aware, Java can be a, a challenge for, for businesses to, to support. As often, there are a number of different applications that require Java, but they all require different versions. Um, so with FX Logic's uh, Java redirection, we're able to provide the right version of Java to any given application. So you could have multiple versions of, of Java essentially installed. The ones that aren't in use at the moment get hidden through the app masking process, but you're able to consistently uh, present the correct version of Java to each application on an as needed basis. So from a, a licensing perspective, um, many customers are already eligible for, for Windows Virtual Desktop uh, from what we see. So for those who've made the transition to, to the Microsoft Cloud, specifically around Office 365 and such, um, you know, many of those customers are already gonna have entitlements. Um, if you happen to have invested in Microsoft 365, so any of their, their business or enterprise SKUs, you have an immediate entitlement to Windows Virtual Desktop. The same is true if you purchase your Windows 10 Enterprise or Education licenses through uh, the, the subscription model that Microsoft provides. Those again give you entitlement to Windows Virtual Desktop. If you are an Office 365 only user, um, there is a step up that's required to get you to the license to support this, um, but it, that's a relatively easy uh, transition. But anybody who's already invested in Microsoft 365 or, or Windows 10 uh, subscriptions can start taking advantage of Windows Virtual Desktop today. Similarly on the server side, uh, for those who might be running a RDS or remote uh, desktop services solution on-prem today, assuming you have RDS Cal licenses with active software assurance, you have the ability to port those server licenses to Windows Virtual Desktop. This won't necessarily give you entitlement to the Windows 10 multi-session elements as is giving you access to the server components, but it's that first step of transitioning your on-prem uh, remote desktop solution into Microsoft uh, Windows Virtual Desktop to at least start that, that journey to the cloud for this. Um, just note at the bottom, so there are a couple things that are worth highlighting. Because this is an Azure solution, uh, we are only paying for virtual machine storage and networking that are consumed when the users are using the service. Um, so the benefit here is, you know, with all of us dealing with the, um, you know, global pandemic issues that, that are, you know, obviously incredibly relevant now, you know, having a solution that users are able to, to leverage when they need to is important. Um, but from a business continu continuity perspective, it's nice that, you know, because this is a solution that dynamically scales up or down on an as needed basis, it's very easy to stand up Windows Virtual Desktop to have a single desktop session available. So sort of like you think like a pilot light on a furnace, it's there, it's ready. It's got minimal cost associated with it with nobody actively using it, but it's available so that as users in a situation like we face today, where all of a sudden we have a whole bunch of remote users that we might not have necessarily have anticipated, Windows Virtual Desktop can easily scale up to support any number of users that are required. And we have a couple of different ways in, that, in which that can be configured. But you have the benefit of, you know, with, with WVD, of having it in place, having it ready there for those uh, business continuity scenarios without having to necessarily in incur a bunch of cost if it's not an actively used solution today. Uh, we also have the ability to leverage uh, reserved instances, which anybody who's using Azure on the server side might be uh, uh, familiar with. But this is basically a prepaid solution where you can um, find pretty significant savings. So noted here up to 72% uh, for those Windows 10 virtual desktops. Uh, but this is just another mechanism if WVD is sort of a go forward solution for an organization and they know they're going to be making that continued investment and leverages as part of their, their desktop deployment strategy moving forward, 
there are mechanisms that Microsoft makes available to help reduce the overall uh, cost for those virtual machines. So digging into the benefits a little bit deeper. Um, so first from a container perspective, so Windows Virtual Desktop or WVD does uh, use native uh, Windows VHD capabilities. There's no hypervisor involved. It's very easy to deploy and manage. Again, it is Azure based, um, which gives us a pretty easy uh, management console and interface. It does provide a, a completely seamless end user experience. Um, so as mentioned, the you know user profile is stored outside of the actual Windows 10 desktop. Uh, applications through App Attach, which is sort of the preferred mechanism in, in Windows Virtual Desktop, those applications get plugged into the VM as well as part of the login process. But from an end user perspective, it's seamless. Uh, users log in, they see their traditional desktop, they have access to all of their user data, their applications know who they are. So as you launch Outlook or Word, you know it immediately knows who that user is, even though that user has been plugged into the VM along with the application. They understand that each, you know, it looks seamless to the end user and to the applications, and they behave as if they, all that data was stored on a single disk. We do have the ability to work with other application management platforms, um, and it's very simple to, to test, implement, and manage um, for those who are interested. And we take advantage of some of the optimization uh, features to ensure that as we're updating these VHD files, we're doing block level transfers. We're only uh, updating the minimal amounts necessary. We're not rewriting entire files, which help us reduce network and file system load. From the profile container perspective, um, as mentioned, so we do store the VHD file um, in a network-based container. It does allow for extremely fast login times because it, again, that profile is immediately available the moment, the moment a user logs in. There is no background caching that needs to happen or script processes that need to run to finish uh, developing that, that end user experience. All of it's immediately accessible, which allows for very quick login times. This uh, VHD solution also helps to virtually eliminate profile corruption. So in other VDI solutions that we've seen in the past, uh, organizations have often relied on things like network mapping and stuff of, of virtual, uh, sorry, of user profile uh, shares. So things like my documents and my pictures and desktop and things of that nature, you know, some organizations and some solutions will leverage um, folder redirection to work out to map, uh, network map drives for these locations. And that type of a scenario can introduce various levels of corruption. It, it can pose some challenges, especially for users who are consistently dependent upon VDI solutions to provide their, their desktop experience. Uh, this VHD attach solution helps eliminate a number of those risks. We're no longer mapping drives or redirecting across uh, across networks. Uh, we're now just literally attaching a, a local VHD file to the VM, and it makes it a, a far cleaner and more elegant approach. Uh, we also work alongside existing user environment management platforms. So existing solutions are most of the solutions that you might have in place today uh, to support your user community from a management perspective. Those should all continue to work. It, in a VDI solution as well. Uh, Office 365, um, so mentioned, this sort of ties back into the, the profile caching elements, uh, but there's a number of things here that, again, help improve that overall end user experience when we're dealing with Office 365. As mentioned, because we do have that persistent uh, data store for the, for the user profile, we're able to take advantage of you know, Outlook OST files and OneDrive caching, Windows search, all these things that are often critical to ensuring a positive end user experience when working with a cloud solution like Office 365. Even though Office 365 and the user data are sort of stored separately and blended together as part of the login process, uh, Office applications have native performance and behavior. So they might be externally stored, but they're treated just like an internally installed application on, on a given uh, desktop, and they behave and, and feel the exact same way. App masking, we've talked a little bit about uh, previously. So application uh, management without sequencing, snapshotting, packaging, or virtualization. So that's important. Um, so as I mentioned, this in a, in a Windows Virtual Desktop or WVD scenario, this is not a preferred mechanism on how we would deliver apps to that virtual machine. Um, this is based off the assumption that all these apps have basically been installed in that base image. Um, so in that scenario where we have a, a number of applications, either again, because we can't sequence them through uh, the app connect or, or whatever the situation may be, or maybe we're using a legacy 
a gold image for as an interim solution that have a number of these applications installed. We have the ability to, again, block this through app masking so that only the applications that a user is entitled to are actually revealed. Um, as highlighted there, so application entitlements uh, can be changed in real time. So if you do have a user who didn't need an application yesterday that was embedded in the image and therefore it was hidden, but they now need access today, it's a very easy, quick and easy process to light up that application and make it available to the user uh, in real time. We're also able to take advantage of things like font packs and, and plugins and, and things of that nature. And again, this is a pretty seamless solution that provides excellent application compatibility. So again, all these applications installed normally as we would traditionally see, but we're only hiding some of them. So there's really no challenges from an application perspective. And the objective with this style, style of solution, again, is to reduce the number of gold images that are required. Um, so in a perfect world, we would often look at, you know, maybe one, one master image to support all of our users or at most a, a couple. You know, many organizations have run multiple gold images in the past as they look to re-image workstations for varying departments and such. The objective when working in a VDI style scenario is to keep that, that image count as low as humanly possible and then to leverage things like either app masking or app connect to provide the um, custom experience that each user needs on a common image versus um, trying to support multiple. And then lastly, we talked about Rav uh, Java redirection as well. Um, so again, we have the ability on a per application or per website basis to define the version of Java that is required um, to ensure that as a user clicks on an application or clicks on a specific website, the correct version of Java is what's presented to that application or site um, so that we can ensure that we don't have any hiccups or, or headaches when, when dealing with Java-based apps. And then FSLogix uh, app masking will hide all the unused versions uh, so that things don't appear cluttered or there's no confusion there. Uh, last thing on FSLogix profiles. Um, so as I mentioned, it is stored in a VHD. Uh, it does get mounted at login um, so that you have uh, you know, quick access. There is no storage that's required on the actual desktop OS itself. Um, so again, because it's a separate VHD that maintains all user data, it allows us to keep our Windows 10 image pristine. Um, all the, the customizations and everything that's tailored to a specific user are stored in that user specific VHD file. One of the nice things is that size of, of profiles doesn't impact login time. So whether you have a 50 meg mailbox or a 50 gig mailbox, um, it really doesn't matter in this scenario because all of that data is already cached and available in the profile VHD file. So regardless of the user type that you have, um, again, it's a very quick and, and seamless login experience. Uh, as mentioned, we do leverage block transfer to decrease network utilization. So we're only transferring the changes versus uh, rewriting entire files or folders. Um, and that's that's really it. So actually, so the last thing there, so we do, do automatically do all the pro, uh, profile container redirection. So when a user looks at my documents, if they're still looking in, at, at that on their C drive. It looks like they're referencing my documents. Applications that expect to see my documents, it appears the same to them as well. It's just backend redirection that's actually happening that's redirecting those folders to that external VHD drive. So there's really nothing that a user needs to be aware of. Windows looks and behaves the same way in, a, in the WVD scenario as it would with an on-prem desktop. All the, their locations are exactly the same. And applications, when they look for those folders to be able to interact with the My Documents folder, for example, it looks and behaves the exact same as the application expects, which gives us a really broad application support. Um, so Windows Virtual Desktop, even though it's a relatively new solution, um, does have a, a pretty broad partner ecosystem. And this is continuing to evolve and, and grow over time. Uh, so there's a number of SIs and GSIs that have made investments in, in expanding upon the, the WVD solution. Uh, for any of you who might have worked with VDI solutions in the past, uh, things like, you know, again, VMware Horizon or Citrix Zen Desktop, some of the ISV or, um, Partners there will, will likely look familiar. Things like ThinPrint and Liquidware Labs and, and Cloudio and, and Lakeside Software, all of those products that have been around for a number of years and have supported other VDI solutions have also been updated to support Windows Virtual Desktop. And we also have some hardware vendors that are coming on board that are building environments um, that are specifically tailored to understand and take advantage of, of Windows Virtual Desktop with some Samsung and Nigel being some of the first. 
for those organizations that might have already made investments in Citrix, um, the good news is you can continue to support that while still leveraging some of the benefits of Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, so this is not an out and out. This can be treated as a, a full-blown replacement for either Citrix you know, Zen Desktop or VMware Horizon, but you also can run in a hybrid scenario where you can continue to leverage the investment in Citrix Workspace or Citrix Virtual Apps on desktops that you may have already made, while still taking advantage of things like the Windows 10 multi-session experience on Azure, all the Office optimizations with Office 365 containers, you know, the profile containers, app masking and such. So you can run that hybrid scenario where Windows Virtual Desktop sits on Azure and, and provides that functionality, but integrates and ties back into any of the existing uh, Citrix Virtual App or Desktop services that you run on-premise. This obviously allows you to rapidly provision Windows Desk Windows Virtual Desktop resources at scale, taking advantage of all the WVD benefits. Well, like I said, continue to manage that existing investment in Citrix. Similarly, organizations that have made investments in VMware Horizon, um, you know, assuming it's an Azure-based solution, there's a, a broad range of uh, benefits available as well. Again, you can run that hybrid scenario. You can take advantage of all the associated benefits of Horizon Cloud. Uh, while still continuing to take advantage of some of the new feature sets that Windows Virtual Desktop brings to market. Uh, so either VMware or Citrix, again, you can leverage that existing investment that you've made. Look at this as an enhancement to provide some additional services that just weren't natively available um, in either the Citrix or VMware solution in the past, and then allow you to make a decision on sort of what that go-forward solution is going to look like as you, you know, evolve and adapt over time. So uh, last slide here before we get into some, some next steps in Q&A. Um, you know, many customers might be wondering, you know, how do you know whether you are a good candidate for Windows Virtual Desktop or not? Um, and really, I think today, as we stand today, I'm going to assume far more customers are good candidates for Windows Virtual Desktop than might have been, let's say, a month ago or so. Uh, but that being aside, um, there's a couple of different key criteria, I think, that, that definitely help uh, prove the value of, of what Windows Virtual Desktop can provide for you. So if you do need the ability to add, um, you know, add users quickly and scale uh, efficiently, if you need to provide that seamless uh, rich client experience for you know, things like Outlook and Cortana, OneDrive, those types of technologies, uh, whether you need to manage different deployment types across different deployment planes, um, you want to bring RDS to your users, you want to leverage persistent or non-persistent desktops, all these scenarios are, are really good use cases potentially for Windows Virtual Desktop. I'm going to assume most customers reading the, the list of self-assessment questions are likely going to find a couple different reasons that uh, this might be a solution that makes sense. Again, as we stand today, where you know we're depending upon a much larger majority of our workforce working remote, uh, one that doesn't list here, but often we're, we're seeing come up more and more is existing uh, remote capabilities are not meeting the demand of, of the users, right? So this might be a scenario where we've built an existing solution, be it remote desktop services or just traditional VPN, and you know, it was built out to support 10% of the workforce or 20% of the workforce in some cases, but we're now trying to support 70, 80, or 90% of our workforce working remote. This style of solution can provide that functionality in a pretty quick and timely fashion. Uh, get you up and operational and start providing those services to allow your people to be productive while remote uh, without necessarily having to invest in additional VPN licensor or other on-prem technology that might have harder costs associated with them and that you can't necessarily spin down should your, your needs move beyond uh, you know, this type of a solution in the near future. So absolutely something to keep in mind. With that, uh, we're going to talk to next steps. Um, so I will comment this was really designed to be an introductory to Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, it was to allow customers to get an understanding of what Windows Virtual Desktop is and potentially how it applies to, uh, to, to our customers. This was, again, sort of a broad overview, but for those customers who think that Windows Virtual Desktop uh, sounds like it might be a good fit for the business, uh, our request would be that you reach out to us at cloud at proserveit.com. Uh, schedule an introductory call. We can deep dive into specific customer requirements. I will also note that Microsoft is investing money in this Windows Virtual Desktop solution. Obviously, again, given the times that we find ourselves in, uh, Microsoft is looking at making investments to help customers with uh, quick adoption of this of this technology. 
Um, so again, if, if that sounds like something that might be of interest to you, please reach out to us at cloud at proserveit.com. We can walk through the solution in more detail. We can walk through any of the funding opportunities that might be available through Microsoft to help drive adoption and, and hopefully uh, help customers provide a, a more robust solution to address some of the remote uh, user challenges today. So with that, I hope this uh, webinar was, was beneficial and, and provided some insight to you all. And with that, we're gonna open up the floor to some Q&A. Yeah, thanks, Bill. That was, uh, I think you provided some great content uh, for this webinar and for the people on the line. Um, I really do think uh, it was a good dive into a, a potential solution for the remote working issue for sure. Um, so, you know, as Bill said, folks, we're going to open the floor here for questions. Um, a reminder, you can use that questions tab, type your questions into the, uh, the field there and we can uh, get them answered for you as soon as possible. Um, while we're doing that, Bill, we do have a question here from Cheryl. She's asking, how does Windows Virtual Desktop handle audio and video sessions such as Microsoft Teams? Fantastic question. And that, actually, that was something that we didn't really talk through in the presentation. So audio video conferencing has, has often been a challenge in VDI sessions, um, just because typically there's so many intermediary steps involved and additional hops required that we typically lose fidelity with audio and more specifically video conversations. Microsoft has made investments with Windows Virtual Desktop uh, and AV redirection to allow endpoints to actually engage directly to cut down a lot of the latency that you would typically see. Um, so where it has been a challenge in the past, specifically around video, but it can also be a case around audio to provide sort of that seamless experience to, to make it feel like you're having a proper one-on-one -on -one conversation in, in a live scenario without those latency or pauses. The WVD solution um, does have that AV redirection option that helps mitigate a ton of that. Um, it does give a near seamless experience, uh, very close fidelity to what you would expect from a traditional desktop experience. So absolutely in this type of a scenario, especially now where we do have all these remote, remote workers, Teams is becoming a more critical component uh, just to keep everybody communicating and collaborating effectively. Uh, it absolutely works well in conjunction with Windows Virtual Desktop to provide a very positive end user experience. Awesome, thank you. Um, we've got a question here from John. He says, as a nonprofit, we've seen some great pricing from Microsoft and many other solutions. In some of this new technology, such as Azure VM Compute, does, uh, does Microsoft offer special pricing there as well? So this falls under the existing programs that you would have in place. Um, so again, as a nonprofit, you are getting you know significantly discounted pricing for your either Office 365 or Microsoft 365 licensing. So again, you can continue to to leverage that that price discount um, to get you to a point where you have entitlement for Windows Virtual Desktop. Then on the Azure side, um, you have your annual grant from Microsoft uh, for Azure consumption that you can again take advantage of for this. So if you're not already leveraging a bunch of services inside of Azure, that annual grant that you that you get. Um, would likely be sufficient and I'm going to put a big asterisk or caveat beside that or at least help offset a good chunk of the uh, assumed cost of, of running WVD in the in the uh, Azure tenant on an ongoing basis. Again, as you continue to spin workstations up and consume additional resources, you're probably going to step outside of that grant. But long-winded way of saying there is no specific Microsoft funded option for WVD. But because you already have entitlement both on the Azure front and on the Office 365 slash M365 licensing front, both of those still apply to help um, help nonprofit organizations enter into this in a, a more cost-effective manner. Hopefully Excellent. that answered your question, John. Yeah, John, if you want to uh, ask a follow-up question, you're certainly welcome to. Um, we've got a question here from Tony. He says that we are running Office 365 E3 today. How do we upgrade our licenses to support Windows Virtual Desktop? Sure. So, sorry, got my little teams here. Um, so basically what happens is if you're already running Office 365, let's say it's Office 365 E3 or um, any of the business SKUs, um, you can easily step up to the Microsoft 365 license. And for those who aren't aware, so Microsoft 365 is a combination of your existing Office 365 license, uh, their enterprise mobility and security suite, as well as a Windows 10 license. Um, so you can actually have all three of those product uh, categories covered with a single per user license. 
Um, if you are an Office 365 user, you can request through your, either through your, your direct purchase through Microsoft or through your licensing provider, um, you can choose to have Microsoft 365 licenses added to your tenant. And then it's just a matter of replacing the users uh, from the O365 license to an M365 license. That then gives them immediate entitlement to all the associated benefits. And for those who have not necessarily looked into Microsoft 365, there's a ton of additional benefits over and above what Windows Virtual Desktop provides, uh, specifically around security and compliance and things of that nature. There's a ton of, of enhanced benefits that are that are worthwhile uh, elements of M365. So definitely worth a look. But yeah, that's it's just a matter of adding the new licenses to your existing tenant and then just swapping out the licenses associated with each user to take advantage of the new feature sets. Awesome. Um, question here from Erica. She said, you mentioned app attached during the presentation. Uh, what is required to take advantage of the app attached feature in Windows Virtual Desktop? Good question. And you're right. So I, I delved a lot into some, the whole app masking piece of SS, FS logic, but not so much about the app attached. Um, so what ends up happening is any of the applications that you have uh, can be migrated or, or packaged as an MSIX uh, attachment, I believe. I think it's MSIX. Um, so basically what ends up happening is the application gets gets wrapped. It gets stored as a, in a separate VHD file. Um, there is a, a process required or a, there's an app, a free download application you install from Microsoft that basically allows you to run the installer for an application in this packaging application. It will create the associated MSIX file for you. Uh, that the, you then can store on the uh, VHD that gets attached to those Windows virtual desktops so that when users log in the through grouping, they will determine, or Windows W uh, Windows virtual desktop, sorry, I mixed between the acronyms and the full name, WVD will identify which applications are associated with a given user. It will pull them out of that pool of MSIX applications on that external uh, external disk. And then app attach will dynamically add those applications to the VM as the user logs in. You also have the ability, as with the app masking process, where if a user is partway through a session and does need additional applications added through PowerShell or, or um, through the, the management console, the Azure management console, you can add additional applications to that session. So it's a dynamic attach detach process, but you do need an MS, MSIX profile or application creator to initially create that, that application in order for it to be eligible for the app attach process. Sorry, a whole lot of words. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, um, we've got another question from John. He said, you mentioned the potential issues of running a client uh, server application in this kind of virtual environment. Have you got some personal experience in seeing this done? And if it was basically successful, even if there was some expected performance degradation? Yep, absolutely. So again, when I mentioned there's the potential for challenges, I don't want to to really indicate that that's always going to be the case. As with many things, there's a number of variables. Excuse me. So a lot of it comes down to bandwidth availability and what the the um, tolerance on that application is. Um, so we find there are many applications that you can run the client in Azure with the back end in an on-prem environment. Again, assuming that you have good connectivity between the two sites. Um, but again, some of it comes down to application specific um, criteria, right? So those that might have a dependency on a SQL database on the back end, where you're running sort of a front end application in the cloud with a SQL database in the back end, you may face some latency issues, but it's very dependent upon a customer environment. So I can't think of any examples of, of applications just outright will never work in a this hybrid scenario with the, the client in the cloud and the backend on-prem. A lot of it really comes down to the specifics of the customer environment and what that latency and connection looks like between Azure and on-prem. So what we've often seen in this type of a scenario is we will stand up Windows Virtual Desktop. You know, we typically pilot this obviously before rolling it into to broad scale production. We will you know, install the client application, test the end user experience, and then it's really up to the customer to decide whether it is a viable solution that, that meets sort of performance expectations, or if not, then we can look at a small engagement to, to migrate that application server from on-prem to the cloud. So we'd again use something like Azure Site Recovery, replicate the VM into Azure, 
do a test failover, make sure it behaves as expected, and then in a scheduled downtime, actually migrate the app application across to Azure, just provide that positive end user experience. Um, so yeah, there's really no hard and fast rules. Like I said, a lot of it depends on the application itself and how it behaves in sort of this, this WAN-based scenario versus LAN, and then the latency and connectivity for this, between the sites as well. Hopefully that answers your question, John. Awesome. All right, folks. I'm not. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in at this time, and I am uh, obviously cognizant of the fact that we are approaching the three o'clock hour. So I think we're going to uh, close questions and answers for now. However, if you do have further questions, you can always email us at cloud at proserveit.com. Reach out to our team. Um, we'll make sure that we uh, get those answered. Que uh, sorry, those questions answered for you as soon as possible. Um, so with that, I am going to say thank you very much again to you, Bill, uh, for joining us today and for sharing your wisdom with us, of course. And thank you to everyone on the line for joining us for this webinar as well. Um, you know, at ProServe IT, we, we do know that these are quite trying times. And, um, you know, we are here to help you however we can. So please feel free to reach out to us, um, you know, whenever you whenever you need us or, or, or if you have questions or if you have concerns at this time. I mean, we are here. We are able to, to help you and to answer those questions for you, um, you know, um, we've done a couple webinars now. We've done actually three. This is Remote Working 103. Um, so, you know, we are going to be providing further content as well. So please, you know, stay tuned, um, check your emails. And, uh, you know, if there's any other content that we can provide for you at this time, we are definitely going to do that um, to help you out. Um, you know, we understand that uh, it's not uh, not the easiest time right now and, and we're all kind of in this together. So thanks so much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. And I'm sure we we will uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, take care. Thanks, Bill. Thank you.